Acts chapter 9, verse 23 is where we resume. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. And now Saul, soon to be the Apostle Paul, has experienced this amazing turnaround from being a Christian hater, a Jesus hater, to someone who's just on fire for Christ. Just an overnight change. No explanation other than Jesus appeared to him, as he said. So anyway, we pick it up in verse 22. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelled at Damascus, proving that he is the very Christ. They confounded the Jews because, or Paul did, or Saul did, I should say, because he's preaching Jesus and he's proven from the scripture that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. Or 24, but they're laying a weight. In other words, their plot was known of Saul. They're going to try to kill him. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. And with the help of the governor, too. The governor turned Damascus into a military fortress in order to capture Saul. You know, when, when Saul persecuted Christians, he was a hero. But now people are trying to kill him. Think about it. Saul did not make the switch because he was bored. Saul did not make that switch. He doesn't make that switch unless he is absolutely certain that Jesus Christ is the risen Lord, is Almighty God, is the only Savior. 25. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. And so Saul, although he had faith to trust God, he also used common sense. Jesus tells us Christians that in this world, we're going to have tribulation. But if we can avoid trouble without violating scripture, then we should do it. 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. A little leery, you know, the Christians in Jerusalem had suffered a lot because of Saul, so they're suspicious. You know, maybe he's trying to trick them. 27, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them, how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Barnabas was a kind person. He always seemed to give people the benefit of the doubt. And so when others didn't trust Saul, Barnabas stood by him. And isn't it true that Barnabas people sure are nice to have around when you need a friend and you can't seem to find one? 28. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him. The Grecian Jews could not out-debate or out-reason Saul when it came to Jesus Christ. So what did they decide to do? Well, they're going to kill him. Brought face to face with the facts, it didn't matter. They were still going to kill him because they loved to believe what they believed. They, like many today, had a truth agenda. You don't want to have a truth agenda. They wanted something to be true so badly that they disregarded all the facts that contradicted it. We shouldn't care what truth is as long as we have truth. 30. Which, when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. And so Saul escapes death once again. And this time he returns to his home in Tarsus. 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, 
and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. And so the Jews, after Saul's conversion, the Jews left Christians alone, at least for a while, because actually if you study history, you know that they had too many other problems to contend with at this particular time. And one of those problems was a big one. The emperor Caligula was trying to set up his image in the holy temple. And when the Jews protested, Rome made war with them. So the Jews had their hands full with Rome. 32. And it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelled at Lydda. And so we shift gears now from Saul to Peter for at least a little bit. And Peter here in verse 30, 32, we see that he visits the church that Philip had started earlier. Verse 33. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. He couldn't move. He was paralyzed, which means he had no hope of ever walking again. 34. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ, make you whole, arise, make your bed. And he arose immediately. In other words, Peter says, you are healed. So start acting like it. You're not a paralytic anymore. So stand up and start walking. Act as if you've been healed. Not a bad suggestion for Christians today also, by the way. Christ has declared that we are not only forgiven, but we have the power to resist sin. So really, there is no reason, there's no excuse for us to live like victims of sin any longer. 35, and all that dwelled at Lydda and Sauron saw him and turned to the Lord. No other so-called God could do the things that Jesus was doing through his apostles. And consequently, those with honest hearts believed the word of God and they received Christ. 36. Now, there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, acts of charity in other words, which she did. Tabitha was a wonderful Christian woman. Now, there's no record that she ever said great things, but she certainly did great things. She was a giver. She gave her time and her money to the service of her Lord by helping people in his name. 37. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. Death was good news for Tabitha, but it was bad news for all who would miss her. You know, people like Tabitha do not grow on trees. Generous people who are kind to those who need it are not commonplace in this old world. So she would be missed. They're not quite ready to give up on her either. 38, and for as much as Lydda was near to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent to him two men desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Now, these people knew the power of Jesus, and so they will call for Peter. They're not willing to accept Tabitha's death, not yet. 39, then Peter arose and went with them. And when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him, weeping, and showing the coats and the garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. She was a good person, very kind, a real servant, and that's why so many people cared about her. You know, the Bible says, those who would have friends must show themselves friendly. And Tabitha certainly did. And 
the people appreciated her so much. So when Peter arrives, they talk to him. It's like they're making a case on behalf of Tabitha that Peter should perform a miracle in Jesus' name and, if possible, raise her from the dead. Now, you know, but when you stop and think about it, it's not so much a case for Tabitha because, like I said before, she's in a happy place. She's doing just fine. It was more like they were making a case for themselves to have joy back in their life with Tabitha there among them. So at any rate, they tell Peter about all the good things that she has done. And then it says in verse 40, but Peter put them all forth, told everybody to get out. He kneeled down and prayed. And turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Her soul returned to her body. And what I like about this is that there was no showmanship here. Peter wasn't there to draw attention to himself. He was there to let Jesus work through him. And he is attempting to do it in the least conspicuous way. He didn't stand up and wave his hands, you know, and shout drawing attention to himself as if he's something special. Peter would never thought of himself as being anything special. Tells everybody to leave. And then he prays. And then he commands to Tabitha to come back, and she does. What story she must have had to tell. 41. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. What a thrill. 42. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. So word spread quickly that Peter, in the name of Jesus, was able to raise this woman back from the dead. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon a Tanner. And so we're reminded that the apostles were extensions of Jesus Christ doing miracles in the early church to show that the message of Christianity is authentic, is the way of salvation and that there is no other. Because no other religious leader and none of his or her followers have ever been able to match the amazing signs that Jesus and his followers did to authenticate the message. And the result was that many people came to Christ. Many people were saved. I say, I wish that could happen today. But let me tell you something. By Jesus' own words, we don't need those things to happen today. Today we have the written word of God, which is the anointed truth. It contains power. And it also contains, written in it, the miracles that testified to the reality of Christ. And so the supernatural word of God will burn in the heart of those who are open to the truth and will cause them to repent and cause them to receive Christ. Therefore, you don't need miracles. That's what Jesus said. They have the written word of God. And if they don't listen, if people don't listen to the word of God, Jesus said, they won't listen to even a miracle. So the written word of God carries the same power and authority that the miracles of Jesus and the apostles did. 